Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Who hasn't had their lives turned upside down when things haven't gone as planned? We understand there are consequences to our decisions, but how do we deal with the after effects of the choices of others? There are other times when things happen beyond anyone's control. Circumstances can leave us feeling hurt and stuck, but God promises healing and hope for all. The story of Bathsheba may seem like an unlikely source of information, but our next guest, Natalie Schnapp, Snap, explains, Bathsheba is often portrayed as the adulteress, as though she was a vixen with the intent to tempt David and hopefully take her on as his wife. However, the fact remains that she was a victim of David's own desires and paid a very dear price for her sin. When you hear the name Bathsheba, what is your first thing that comes to mind, vixen or victim? Bathsheba, typically misrepresented as an adulteress, is one of the most misunderstood women in the Bible. Despite an unexpected turn in her life, which resulted in tragic circumstances beyond her control, there are glimmers of hope in her story. In fact, transformation happens during renovation. Natalie Chambers Snap is an author, blogger, and speaker known for her refreshing authenticity and practical approach to life and God's word. Not choosing to follow Jesus until the age of 27, uh, a baby, because I was 44, <laughs> she is passionate about sharing the grace, mercy, and truth of God's love with others regardless of your track record. Her transparency, her transparency and humor endear her to women of all ages. She's the author of the book, Heart Sisters, Be the Friend You Want to Have. Becoming Heart Sisters, a Bible study on authentic friendships and the Bathsheba battle, finding hope when life takes an unexpected turn. She has written for various blogs and online devotionals, including Proverbs 31. You can learn more about Natalie at natalysnapp, S-N-A-P-P, dot com. Here to talk about the Bathsheba battle, finding hope when life takes an unexpected turn, is the oh-so-late-in-life-coming-to-faith, Natalie <laughs> Chambers Snap. Natalie, <laughs> welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Oh, it's great to have you. I was 44. And I accept well, the you know, we all come in at different times, right? Yeah, and the important and, thing and, is and, that we come in. <laughs> and, and different flavors. I came in as the uh, Jewish flavor. That's the, uh, uh, that's, uh, that, that is definitely not the flavor of the month uh, well, to come to faith. Uh, but I came out of the synagogue, into the synagogue. I've never been a part of Christianity in my life. So, I'm all okay. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm on the uh, um, what, what would you call it, Jason? The shady side uh, of of uh, on my way to seventy, or my or my, my the sunny side. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, it's very very interesting when you come later in life because you have observations and you have pre preconceived notions and you have ideas and when you finally come to faith you find out that um, there's truth and then there's truth and then there's truth and then there's truth and you're really confused because this one does it this way and this one does it this way yeah. and they both say that they're right that's right yeah. so it's got to be kind of hard how was it for you? Um, I would agree with you on that. In fact, I just had that conversation with my son. I have a 14-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old son and an 11-year-old son. So I have one full-fledged teenager and one coming right on the heels. And, you know, I think a lot of times teenagers ask hard questions, and I never discouraged hard questions, especially hard questions about faith. So he asked me not too long ago that very question. Um, he wanted to know, you know, Mom, He's got friends that are um, of different faiths, and, and they believe that their way is right. And, and how can we say that our way is right? 
my answer to him was, you have to seek truth and make your faith your own at some point. This is what I believe and this is what I'm telling you, but you still must respect the beliefs of other people. Um, and you still must decide on your own what you believe. Um, and then you live by that. So you and I may believe different things. That's completely okay. We can still come together and have a conversation that is respectful, which I think is so lacking in our world today. Uh, we can still sit by each other. You know, I just think it's so funny that this picture of Ellen and George W. Bush sitting together has just blown up on social media because it's so foreign. I mean, this makes news. Two people who have opposing views are sitting together and chose to sit together at an event. And it's such a big deal. And why is it such a big deal? Because we don't know how to have conversations that are healthy about our differences. So while I believe uh, in one way, I'm never going to walk in and sit down next to you and start telling you that you're wrong and my way is right. That's not the way that change ever happens, nor is it my agenda to try to change you. It's so interesting that people feel like they have, and I'm going to try to rattle this off as fast as I can, the ability, the responsibility, the power, the authority, the right, the entitlement, the knowledge, the wherewithal, the strength, the God-given power to change anyone. Right. Right. Okay. I, I, I came to faith and my, my, and, my, and my confession was not just that I was a sinner. I'm not God and I'm right. not the Holy Spirit. And when right. I opened up the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and I looked at the one ads, I looked up and I looked at alphabetically and it did not, there was no Holy Spirit position yeah. open. <laughs> and then I went nope. to the, I went to the first to the V, to, to the T for the V, because I thought it would be the God. Uh, right. uh, but then I went just straight to G, to God, and that wasn't open either. Right. Our, You're right. our thought process that we, that, that, and, and, and I want to make this as clear because this isn't just for you. This is for the millions of people that are watching us right now around the world. The moment you go to God and you say, Lord, I want you to change so-and-so, you have said to him, you have made a mistake, you didn't do it right, and I know better than you how that person's supposed to be. Right. That is the five I wills of the book of Isaiah. Satan said all five of them, and you're just saying one of them, and you're standing there right before the throne of God saying, my husband, he needs to change. That, that man needs to change. Not my husband, your husband, okay? My husband doesn't need change. I don't have a husband. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? People, people do this all the time. I do. All right. I Lord, do. Lord, please change my husband. No. Yeah. Lord, let there be change. Let it begin with me. I do think we can say, please heal my husband or please heal somebody that is struggling. Um and ask for God, ask for them to humble themselves and open their hearts to the healing that God can provide. But only, you're exactly right, and I totally agree with you, only the Holy Spirit can change people. We just have to pray that people will humble themselves to what the Holy Spirit has for them, and that absolutely includes us. In fact, that's something I pray every morning, <laughs> that my heart will be humble and soft to what He has for me to learn that day. It's very, very important. The, the, the prayer that God really wants us to ask is, is, is David is the example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Search me, O oh God. Yeah. Search That's me. Right. Okay. right. Um, I don't know, are you Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled? I just attended a non-denominational church. Okay. It's called uh, City of God. Okay, I'm a Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled Jew. Okay. Okay. That, that means that I take 
this and everything that's in it, I do it all. Okay. If, if it's in there, I do it. If, if, if okay. it's in the odds word, I'm fine with it. If it means okay. I can walk by a dead person and say, get up, and they get up, and I keep on walking, I don't make a big deal out of it because it's in the Word of God. Okay? It's, just, okay. it's just how I feel. Um, okay. God wants us to, to present to him our hands, and your pastor probably told you this is surrender, or this is worship, and this is this, and this is that. And the Bible says... Who can go up to the mountain of the Lord? The one with clean hands. And so what am I doing when I'm lifting my hands to the Lord? I'm saying, search me, O God. Look at my hands. See what I have set my hands to do. And if they are clean, then let me up the mountain of the Lord. And if they are not, Lord God, correct me, wash me. Wash me with the word. Wash me with, with the, the, the water of the word, with, 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 with the fullness of the word. Cleanse me so that I may return to you, O oh Lord God. And right. this, this was all from the, the adultering, murdering, lying, cheating, stealing, conniving David. Right. A man after God's own heart. That's correct. How do, we, how do we get to this story? How do we get to David? How do we get to understand this man whose promise to him shall be the source of our everlasting hope? Our second Peter 3.15. Hope is that God will be faithful to the covenant he made with David. That there will always be a Jew to sit on the throne of Israel. And right now the throne is empty. There is no throne. But when that throne is built, there is going to be a Jew sitting in it. And it's going to be Jesus. So how did this guy, this, this adulterer, this philanderer, this, this, and, 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 and how did uh, uh, he get to the position of having people do his bidding not just because he was king but because he was beloved it's a difference mm -hmm. pharaoh was king he was not beloved mm -hmm. nebuchadnezzar right. was king he was not beloved no and david was king he was beloved but which is probably also um, you know, I think we see it even now in our celebrity culture where people will elevate themselves and they think they're invincible, they're untouchable, and they're entitled. And my guess, and, and something that I say in, in the Bathsheba battle is, you know, God hasn't changed his recipe for making people. Uh, we still have emotions and we still have happiness and joy and grief. Uh, there are definitely cultural changes from back in biblical times and, and before Jesus and it, definitely different things that we were facing. However, we're still created with the same recipe. He hasn't changed that. So I can't help but wonder if David struggled a little bit with his power and, and the love that the people had for him. And so that entitlement led him to the exploitation of Bathsheba. And really probably, well not probably, the biggest stumble that King David um, experienced and something that really, really humbled him before the Lord was, was, were his actions with Bathsheba and Uriah. What led you? <clears throat> so here you are, 27 years old, you're just, um, uh, soaking it all in, you, you're now, uh, let's, let's call this kind of a, a halfway mark. Um, 27 live, 27 years behind, 27 years to go to reach an age of biblical maturity. I consider about 20, 25 years in the Lord a biblically mature person. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, 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 you're right there. You're right on the cusp. You're 
27 years old, you, you've seen life, you now- I have to stop you really quickly. I'm yeah. not 27, I'm 46 now. No. I didn't become a follower or a believer till 27. Right. So that's, now I'm 46. Right, that's correct. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't want to say I was a 27 year old. No, 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 no. We're talking about when you no. We're talking about when you came to faith. Yes, yes, okay? yes. When you came to faith, you were 27 years old. That's correct. Okay. So I'm saying, like, if we were to look at that as a halfway point to biblical maturity, you're getting mm -hmm. you're getting closer and closer as years go by to where you don't need to carry the Bible with you everywhere because the word of I hid in my heart. Uh, yes. You've got great messages, great studies, things that become a yes. part of you. There's things you yes. don't know, but there's things that you are yes. attracted to knowing, things you want to know. You have your wish list, your to-do list. So my question to you is, when did Bathsheba hit your radar? That's a great question. Um, well, you had mentioned that my first book was Heart Sisters, and in Heart Sisters, I have a section where I talk about the Super Seven Sisters, and it's basically looking at the women of the Bible and maybe different uh, friend personalities that we know who might relate to the different women throughout the Bible. For example, your Mary friend is someone who's your prayer warrior because we see that Mary was just such a faithful prayer warrior and so loyal. Your Deborah friend is, is someone who gives good, um, wise counsel when you need it. Your Bathsheba friend is someone who's been through really, really hard stuff and lived to tell about it and has therefore gained wisdom. So every time I would go on uh, out on the speaking circuit to different speaking engagements and we would discuss those Super 7 sisters, usually a break followed right about that point. Um, and I had so many women come up to me and say, hey, I'm a Bathsheba babe. That's what I call them because I am too. And it got me thinking that if this many women were identifying with the way I was describing Bathsheba, not the way she's usually portrayed, but the way that I was describing her, which is how I describe her in the book, um, then we might need to explore this a little bit further. So it really got me thinking about how she is so often misrepresented, that she is portrayed oftentimes, as you said, a vixen or an adulteress. But when we really study the story of Bathsheba, we don't see any evidence of her misstepping anywhere. Um, she was bathing in a courtyard. A lot of people believe she was up on a rooftop, but she was actually bathing where she in a basin in the courtyard of her home. Now, this sounds scandalous by today's standards, of course, but when we remember that there wasn't indoor plumbing back then, this was customary for women following menstruation to do a ritual cleansing, and that's exactly what she was doing. King David, on the other hand, was on the rooftop of his palace. He was located nearby, and from his vantage point, he could look right down into the courtyard and see Bathsheba, Bathsheba excuse me, bathing. That's a tongue twister. And so he looked down and saw this beautiful woman, and already King David wasn't where he was supposed to be because his men were out fighting a war. And back then it was customary for kings to go be right alongside their men in battle. So already we see David where he wasn't supposed to be, which is so true of sin. When we choose sin, oftentimes we're not somewhere we should be. And so we see that in David. He looks down. He wants to know who she is. He finds out who she is. Then he summons her to the palace. Now we have to stop and think about that too for just a minute. Back then, if Bathsheba did not follow that royal command, what would have happened to her? The consequences for not obeying the king back then were pretty severe. So she's no dummy. She goes to the palace. And while there, they have sexual relations. The Bible does not say anything other than that they were intimate. However, there are theologians that believe that she was sexually assaulted by David. These are things that we do not absolutely know. But since God didn't change his recipe for people, I'm guessing that she's summoned to the palace and the king wants to have sex with her, I don't think she had much of a choice. So then Bathsheba becomes pregnant and notifies David, and he begins to panic because he realizes that he's gotten himself into quite a, a pickle. So just like any other time we sin, it will take you further and further down the spiral, further than you ever planned to go. So instead of confessing and coming forward and saying, 
I messed up. I did something wrong. His plan was to cover it up. And his way to cover that up is to call Uriah, who happened to be Bathsheba's husband, and also one of his most revered warriors who was out fighting the battle where David should have been to begin with, calls him back from battle. And his strategy is to prepare a huge banquet with lots of wine and send him home to visit his wife. David strongly suggests to Uriah, you should go home and visit your wife. And everybody knows what that means. Because that way, if Uriah goes home and and visits Bathsheba, if they have sex, he can pawn that baby off as Uriah's and go on his merry way. But what he didn't anticipate was the fact that Uriah was such a man of noble character and integrity. And he refused to go visit his wife and have sexual relations with his wife when his men were fighting in a battle. So he believed and he followed the king's orders just like Bathsheba did and left the battle and went to see the king. But he slept with the servants, not one night, but two, because David tried twice. On the second night, it became apparent that, that Uriah was not going to cooperate with this plan. So he goes back to battle. Now here's what David does next, and this is where we talk about him being a murderer. He sends Uriah to the front line of the battle where, of course, he's killed immediately. So now we have Bathsheba, who has possibly been sexually assaulted, likely, in my opinion. She's pregnant, and her husband is now dead. After a certain period of time, she is forced to marry the man who did all these things to her. And at this point, Nathan, who was a prophet during the time, goes to David and offers a great story that convicts David and makes him see what he has done. And David, thankfully, is humbled and repentant. However, there's always a consequence to our sin. Uh, There's always going to be discipline. And I, I explain this. It's a really hard thing, I think, sometimes to understand about God. Because if we can think of God as a good parent, he is the good, good father. If we can think of him in that way, you know, with my own children and anyone who has children, if we don't discipline them when they misstep, then what's going to happen? They're not going to take us seriously. They're not going to respect us. And they're not going to learn. So the discipline, unfortunately, in this situation was the life of the child that Bathsheba was carrying. And that child died soon after he was born. So now we have Bathsheba, who is married to the man who caused a lot of trauma in her life, and her child dies, her firstborn child dies. It's a really sad story when we look at it there. Thankfully, it doesn't end there, though. Um, And we can see, too, just like what we were talking about before, Bathsheba did not do any of this on her own. This was all done to her. Now, there are times when our own choices and situations have consequences that we bring on ourselves. But in this situation, Bathsheba is not really guilty of anything. Unfortunately, though, she had to pay the price of someone else's choices and someone else's sin, which that happens in our lives now, too. We can be in a situation where, um, you know, someone else's sin, someone else's actions are having a negative impact and hurting and devastating us. And that was the same situation for Bathsheba. So thankfully the story does not end there. Uh, Bathsheba becomes pregnant again and they give birth to King Solomon. And of course, King Solomon was a, a, he wasn't perfect like his dad, but he was a very revered and respected wise king wrote, all the Proverbs, most of the Proverbs. Um, And many theologians believe, and this is the part that I love, that Bathsheba wrote Proverbs 31 as a letter to King Solomon to, uh, for what to look for in his future wife. But what I love the most about Bathsheba's story is we, we see someone who had a lot of really unfortunate things happen to her in her life, but she chose to be a survivor rather than a victim. And we see evidence of that in 1 Kings 1 when she goes to to David on his deathbed. And this is my favorite, favorite part of the story, I think, where we can all glean such hope. And the reason why she goes to him on his deathbed, he he doesn't have long to live. And back then, it was not considered respectful for even the wife to approach the king on the deathbed. So this was a bold move. 
Nathan is still around, and he had gone to Bathsheba, and he said, listen, David's other son, Adonijah, is threatening to usurp the throne from Solomon. Somewhere along the line, David had promised Solomon to be the rightful heir. That's not recorded in Scripture, but there's references to it. The exact moment is not in Scripture, but there are references to it. So Nathan advises Bathsheba to approach King David because what he feared could happen was that Adonijah would have Bathsheba and Solomon killed so that they would not be a threat to the throne. So Bathsheba summons up her courage, and I also love how she knew how to speak to her husband in a way that he could hear. So she had great wisdom on how to communicate, she had great courage, and she went to his throne, or I'm sorry, she went to his deathbed and explained the situation. And that is how Solomon became king. So when we look at the progression, we see someone that had terrible things happen, who chose to be a survivor, who later had a voice of empowerment. And I think that's the number one thing that we can take from Bathsheba's story today, um, that we don't have to be victims, that we might have had unfortunate things happen to us, or maybe we've had unfortunate things happen at our own hand, but we don't have to stay under shame, and we certainly don't have to remain victims. In fact, God doesn't want us to remain victims. And I believe completely that shame is straight from the enemy. So getting Uh, out from under that. You said it very clearly, transformation happens during renovation. That's a a very um, concise way. But I want to give you a section of the Hebrew narrative, uh, taking in the translation from the text and telling you, summarizing for you what just happened. So if Bathsheba is portrayed as passive in her early relationship with David, she becomes strongly active toward the end of David's life in her successful attempt to ensure that her son Solomon will inherit the throne. First King 1 shows her plotting along with the prophet Nathan and other supporters of Solomon to convince David that he's promised the kingship to Solomon. David is by now a pathetic figure who has lost control over his sons long ago. The first three of David's sons have already died, and the succession will be decided between the fourth son, Adonijah, and the, de- and the destined heir, Solomon. The operative familiar relationship is the mother-son relationship and is emphasized in the way the narrator refers to the characters in 1 Kings 1.5, who says, Adonijah, son of Haggith, and Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Mm -hmm. The wording. Yes, very interesting. The wording Mm -hmm. establishes everything is in the wording. Mm -hmm. And this is why the establishment of Solomon's mother being Bathsheba uh, and looking at where she stood in the heart of David Uh, was the determining factor and it supports an absolute fact in scripture that in the Old Testament of the 6,356 roughly different Hebrew words used to write the Old Testament, not a single word of them means brain. Because a man does not think with his brain. <laughs> All right? So a man thinks with his heart. Right. 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 And so, therefore, the way we present words are meant to either pierce the heart because it's in love, to pierce the heart to convict, or to mm-hmm. pierce the heart to judge. Yes. And when it was presented in 1 Kings 1 and 5 as Adonijah, son of Haggith, and then six verses later, Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, mm-hmm. that was yes. a heart shift. Absolutely. Very good point. I love that. And that, and that is the, in, the, in the Hebrew 
uh, narrative as we look at, 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 at how, ca how could, what, what's, the, what's the pivot point? What change? Where does the narrative change? It changes in the word order, in the presentation, and it changes to the place in which all decisions are made, and that is the heart. We're, right. talk, we're talking with Natalie Chambers Snap, the author of the new book, The Bathsheba Battle, Finding Hope When Life Takes an Unexpected Turn. Uh, couldn't be more unexpected than bathing on your rooftop and finding out that you are now chosen by the king. And right. life takes on a whole new direction. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to dig in to some of the more profound discoveries of what do we do? How do we make this practical? How do we take this lesson? And why does God give it to us? And what does he expect us to do with it? Does he expect, us, does he expect us to follow the path that she followed? Take the stand that she stood uh, in the beginning or in the middle or in the end. Or maybe our growth is to go from passive, learn, grow, grow in wisdom, grow in knowledge so that we may become strong and phrase and appeal to God in the way that will bring the best result. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel. But nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. 
Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Natalie Snap, author of the newly released book, The Bathsheba Battle, Finding Hope When Life Takes an Unexpected Turn. Natalie, great to have you back with us. Thank you. Natalie, you share about the hardship uh, and disappointment in your own life that provided some of the inspiration uh, for the Bathsheba battle. Mm -hmm. uh, 99% of all books are written to the author first. Yes. Not to the reader. Absolutely true. <laughs> and the cathartic, the therapeutic, the yeah. uh, epiphomatic, I'm going to I'm going to add words to the English language. Uh, <laughs> it's It's been a language that's fascinated me all my life because I can hardly speak it. Uh, <laughs> yes. The um, things that you've been through, when you look back on them, and we don't need to know what you've been through because that's not what's important. Right. As a matter of fact, when people give their testimonies, and um, we do, Jason and I go out and, and um, we'll do a program in a city in front of a group and, and people give their testimonies, we'll tell them, we don't want to know what happened before. We want right. to know what's happened since. Absolutely. Now, your reference can be, um, you know, it didn't start out this way. That's fine. Okay? Yeah. Mine didn't start out that way. Okay? Right. I came out of the boardroom of two major Fortune 500 companies. Uh, didn't start out in ministry. Uh, didn't start out at 44. I came out of the synagogue where I was trained. I was third, every third generation of my family's a rabbi. Uh, oh, wow. Deeply entrenched in it. Right. Uh, but you had disappointment. You had hardship. Oh, yes. And you didn't know what to do with it. No. How, right. how did this journey help you reconcile that journey? Mm. Well, that is a very deep and poignant question. Um, I would say that I am still in the process of becoming. Um, I don't ever plan to be completely uh, whole on this side of heaven. So, but mm -hmm. it did begin, I think that when we go through trauma, when we go through, um, and, and a lot of times trauma gets thrown out there, and we think that people who've suffered trauma are people who've had really big things happen divorce, the death of a child, um, accidents, natural disasters. But trauma actually impacts us in, in smaller events as well. Um, I believe that trauma happens when we can, when something happens in our life that separates it into a before and an after. So when I was 27 years old, I had a couple of things happen to me that allowed me to reassess what I believed. And that was my before and after point. And so from that point on, I began to seek how to survive empowered rather than being a victim. Based on the things that I had walked through and my um, up and down childhood preceding that, I could have very easily chosen to lay down and kind of take on the more woe is me type of attitude. But I just did not have that in me. So I began to really seek God and read the Bible and decide for myself what I believed. I had been raised what we always call Christers. We went to church at Christmas and Easter. Uh, we went to church when it was convenient. If there was a Sunday we wanted to sleep in late, we did. It wasn't a huge priority. Now, I will say my mom has always had a strong faith, and she, she used those words in our home when we were growing up. So I, I was raised around it, but I didn't even know what the word gospel meant. When people started talking to me about the gospel when I was 27, I really seriously thought they were talking about gospel music. I, I was so confused. I did not know what that was. 
And so thankfully, I got to see God place several resources and people in my path right when I was seeking him to answer questions like that. And one of them was a representative from an organization called Priority Associates. And they're essentially um, what we used to call Campus Crusade. They're now called Crew. Uh, But they are a division of Crew that targets people after college. And so I had met this woman, Marcy, and she and I began to meet for coffee once a week and work through some studies. And what I really loved about Marcy is that she listened to me without judgment. You know, you don't get to the age of 27 and not have done some things you're not super proud of. And that was certainly me. Um, I I went to college and I I had all kinds of fun in college and I made choices that I shouldn't have made, uh, that I I wouldn't have made uh, after I had become a follower of Jesus, but that's part of my story. And so for the first time uh, ever, I felt like Marcy listened to me without judgment and she said to me, None of that matters. You are loved and forgiven. And hearing that message at the time when I had just gone through some very, very big trauma, two big events had happened within three months of one another. That was the message I needed to hear. And so instead of coming at me in a judgmental, uh, really kind of strict way, she came at me with love and grace, which is what we're told over and over again will reach the hearts of more people. And that's no different for mine. Did she lead with John 3.17 or John 3.16? I can't remember. Well, I want you to think about that because most people know John Mm 3.16 cut the number in half. As to, who, uh, as to who knows John 3.17. And John 3.17 is the only part that makes John 3.16 power and real and applied and freeing. Just mm-hmm. because God, just because you have eternal life Okay, I have eternal life. Right. But he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Right. No. He sent him to save the world. And that's what yeah. people don't understand. Right. And his saving is through his grace and love. And so you were able to receive that in spite yeah. of your, so I'm gonna ask you the magic question. So okay. here you are, you've gone through this difficult time and uh, you're struggling. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not only are you reciting to a third party, you're reliving it, you're actually facing it. You are taking not a mirror, you're actually standing in one of those three way mirrors that you stand in mm-hmm. when you get fitted for, you're seeing, you're not only seeing it head on, but you're seeing it on both sides coming at you. And you're yes, realizing yes. that this is all much bigger, much more encompassing than my little one-dimensional de- uh, dissertation on the description of it. It's pretty big. Yes. What was it? What was it? The taught that allowed you and gave you the strength to take one more step? Well, during that season, it was learning about my new faith and feasting and making up for lost time on God's word. So once I was presented with the gospel and understood that it wasn't music, I mean, it is music, but when we talk about receiving the gospel, it means something different. Once I accepted Jesus, I just, um, I've heard it called a quickening spirit. I just was hungry. I wanted to know. I wanted to feast on his word. And I immersed myself in learning about God 
and 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 why he gave us Jesus and what his intention for this world is and who he truly is because I think like Bathsheba Jesus is rep- misrepresented quite a bit so I really am a, a lover of truth I want to know the truth and so I embarked on a journey that I continue to this day of just feasting on that scripture. So during that time, I was able to stand on the rock of of the truth. And even when I was standing on a rock and the storms and and the waves were crashing all around me, I knew I wasn't going to sink. And so I think that's the message that we can see in Bathsheba's story and what anyone else who has gone through an unexpected turn, and let's face it, who hasn't? I don't really know many people who have, can say that their life has never once taken an unexpected turn. So when we find ourselves in the midst of that and we, we, see, we ask ourselves, why me? Or, gosh, I didn't see this coming. We can stand on the rock of God's truth and the faith. And it sounds very trite and it sounds very cliche, but it's very true. And that's what did it for me. And that's what did it for Bathsheba. Exactly. She knew because of David, she knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She came into a family, back door, side door, wrong door, right door, doesn't matter. Once you're in, you're in. And you come as you are. And God may hold you accountable and there are consequences, pruning. But in the case of the pruning of Bathsheba, brought forth the king who built the temple. The yes. one who had been predetermined that David had been told that it would not be him, but it would be his son Solomon. It would not be his son that he would have that would die by Bathsheba. He yes. knew. He already knew. He already knew that this wasn't the son. So for yes. whatever comfort there was, he knew until Solomon was born. And to his joy and to his delight, it was a gift to him. Absolutely. Bathsheba. Yep. Right. So God will use a broken vessel to deliver the whole message. Yes, that's right. We don't have to be whole for him to be holy. That's right. So as you journey through these difficult times, you saw how comparison, how fear, how all these things robbed you of your joy and yes. we're robbing others of their joy. Absolutely. What message do you have for those that are still struggling? Those that are still fighting with the Pinterest, the mm. uh, Instagram, the Facebook, <laughs> the YouTube, the MyTube, the... the uh, 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 the test tube, all of it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, okay. So I mentioned earlier that I have teenagers. So we talk about social media every day in our house. Um, It is definitely a vehicle to breed ingratitude because what happens is, and there've been studies done on this. um, I'm currently working to get my, uh, uh, mental health counseling degree in in graduate school. And we've actually written on studies on this topic. When women in particular, but men do it too, when they scroll through social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook, they actually start to report higher levels of depression and anxiety the longer they spend on social media. Why is that? Because of comparison. Because we forget that we're seeing everybody's highlight reel. So nobody is putting on Facebook, you know, this morning, and this is a true story. This morning, my dog is sick and he had some issues all over my 
my living room rug and about 10 minutes before I was going to sit down with you. And then my son's school called and said that I needed to come get him and because he was sick. And no one's posting stuff like that. They're posting how great their marriage is and how they're celebrating 18 years of marriage. And listen, I'm all for that. But what they're not sharing is, I wonder what it took to get you to 18 years. Was it always roses? Probably not. We're not sharing the real truth on our social media platforms. We're sharing the highlight reel. And there's nothing wrong with that because I'm not saying that we need to tell everyone everything. But we do have to remember when we're scrolling through that we're just seeing the best of everybody's lives. When we understand that truth, then we're protected. We're wearing armor from God of truth. We're protected when we're engaging in social media. But if we don't understand that truth, we're going to fall easily into the trap of comparison. And comparison is when we look sideways at what others have instead of up, for what, up at what God has for us. And comparison really is rooted in fear. Because I believe that fear is really at the heart of almost every negative emotion. So if we're comparing ourselves, we're usually fearful that we're not enough or that we're not getting it done. So it's, it can be traced back to fear. Shame is very embedded in fear. Uh, shame tells us that we're a bad person instead of we did something bad that we need to repent of. And that's rooted in fear. So a lot of this can be traced back to fear. And acknowledging that we're feeling that way and identifying that fear is the first way to combat that. I would love to see you walk out of uh, this room, take a uh, Sharpie, take your refrigerator door and put it in six boxes. Okay, you have how many? You have three children? I right? do. Right? Two, uh, a husband and yourself and the dog. Yes. Right? Two right. dogs. <laughs> right. oh, two, oh, two dogs. So now you can put both dogs together. Right? Okay. And call it things that really happened that I will never post on Facebook. <laughs> and every yeah. day walk down the steps and look at what it is and have yourself a good laugh at oh. the reality of it. Imagine the change in the countenance. Imagine the change that would take place if you could share with people you love, because they're gonna find out anyways, uh, just another method to get this message across that God didn't make a mistake when he made you. He made you perfectly and wonderfully and in his, his, his image. We're talking with Natalie Snap, author of the new book, The Bathsheba Battle, Finding Hope When Life Takes an Unexpected Turn. A journey through the development, the development of temptation, the battlefield of temptation, but the success when you've navigated and held firm and held on to God's truth, what God can do in building a kingdom out of what was an error. That's the God we serve. Natalie Snap, thank you. Thank you thank for sharing you. this with us. And remember, the transformation happens during renovation. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. God bless. We're going to take a short break. And when yeah. we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.